Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, fellow Knife Junkie. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, episode number 50. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to monumental episode number 50. Bob, in the podcasting world, number 50, number 100, those kind of things are... uh, our milestones, monuments, if you will. So I know we kind of mentioned it on episode 25, but episode number 50, yeah. man, it doesn't seem like that long ago. No, it doesn't. It doesn't at all. Actually, um, uh, it makes me think of my New Year's resolution to be more consistent about things. And I had mm-hmm. I had these uh, different ideas of how I would do that, but it ends up that it's through this podcast that I'm fulfilling my New Year's resolution for 2019. So. Well, there we go. Glad we can help. I, I, feel, like we're just, <laughs> I feel like we're just getting started, Jim. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, I want to remind you that today's podcast is brought to you in part by the 40th edition of Knives 2020. Man, it's a uh, awesome book. 40th anniversary, 40th edition, if you will. It showcases blades of every class, every style, more than 800 full color images, along with descriptions of the makers who created them. The Knives uh, book bomb is is a mainstay in the uh, in the knife world, if you will. Yeah, it is. It's one of those books that uh, over the years. If I uh, dipped into Borders Books, which no longer exists, or uh, Barnes & Noble, I would always gravitate towards that book and hang out in the stacks for right. you know a half hour just looking at all the new knives. Oh, I've seen that. seen that. I have that. And uh, yeah, just, yeah, just a, a great, great book. book. Well, and you can get your copy now. It just came out, I think, earlier this month, Knives 2020, the 40th edition. You can get it by going to thenifejunkie.com slash knives2020. That's the knifejunkie.com slash knives2020 and get your brand new hot off the press edition of Knives 2020. And Bob, before we go any for any further, a little bit of sad news in the knife world you want yeah. to hit. Well, uh, Pete Gerber, the founder of Gerber Knives, uh, passed away this past week. And, um, you know, Gerber has, uh, has a long and storied history in my own personal life. My dad had a um, sort of their version of the 110 folder back in the 70s. And it was a great, amazing folder. I used to have to like get up on my tippy toes to reach the shelf where it was when my dad wasn't around so I could pull it out of the sheath. Uh, Amazing knife. Uh, So Pete Gerber started the company in 1939 with his dad. They had an advertising agency. And one year as a as a sort of gift to their clients, they sent out custom made knives and uh, people loved them. And that same year, uh, the the brand took off uh, as a knife company. And uh, when, in a little twist of irony, Ab- Abercrombie and Fitch was uh, one of the first companies to to add Gerber knives to their catalogs. Now, hmm. if you go to the mall today and go by Abercrombie and Fitch, all you'll see are giant posters of sort of prepubescent models like hanging out half nude. Uh, but back in the day, it was kind of a serious uh, outfitter, and uh, and you could buy all sorts of uh, outdoor gear. Anyway. Uh, under Pete Gerber's reign, um, he brought in Bob Loveless, the legendary mm-hmm. knife maker, uh, as a lead designer. And, uh, they were the ones who, who really, um, pioneered injection molding handles, uh, with the LST folding knife. So, I mean, that they sort of, uh, helped usher the folding locking knife world into the modern era. And, uh, all of that was under, uh, Pete Gerber's, uh, watchful mm-hmm. eye. So it's, right. it's sad to, uh, it's sad to see, a legend of the industry go. Right. Well, we mentioned earlier, this is episode number 50 of the podcast, a uh, milestone, if you will, but uh, some news about the podcast, Bob, that we want to share. But mm-hmm. uh, we'll share that after this great interview that you had with, uh, and, uh, and encourage everybody to stick around for that because you'll want to hear it. But after uh, after the uh, interview with Alex from Alex's Knife Box, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll hear that news about the podcast. Yeah. Alex is, uh, one of my buddies online. He's, he's, uh, he's really my first close knife friend. That sounds kind of goofy. Uh, and, and, uh, he sort of epitomizes the knife community to me. He's, uh, he's, uh, really generous and outgoing and, and like everyone else I've met, uh, so far in this, uh, in this podcast, he's, uh, always looking to reach out and, and make bridges and talk to people about their knives. And, and he uh, reached out to me early on. And, uh, we've just been back and forth online endlessly. He's got a beautiful collection and he also epitomizes that reduce and refine we've been talking about, uh, thanks to Epic Snuggle Bunny. You know, he, mm-hmm. he like me has a voracious appetite for knives, but it's not about necessarily the brand 
or what have you. It's the beautiful designs. You know, he'll he'll do anything from a CRKT Pilar to a you know Grimm's Mo Norseman and and everything in between. And so it's just a real love of knives. And we <laughs> we had a great conversation. We it's like a sewing circle. You know, two two guys just talking about knives. We could keep going and going. Now, how would you know about sewing circles? Oh. I grew up in the seventies. I, I saw my grand, my grandma and grandpa. I mean, my grandma and mom and sister hanging out, just chit chatting. Oh, okay, there you go. Well, uh, we want to encourage uh, fellow knife junkies that are listening to subscribe to Alex's uh, Knife Box YouTube channel. We'll have the link to his channel in the show notes, and that'll be found at thenifejunkie dot com slash five zero. Thenifejunkie dot com slash fifty. Alex also is part of a great uh, knife podcast called Sharp Talk. And uh, he and his co-hosts invited me onto their show a couple weeks ago, and we had an absolute blast. It was almost went three hours, and uh, we were talking about everything under the sun. The show has a great format, and uh, uh, we talk about that a bit in the interview, too. Yeah, and uh, we'll also try to actually put that on the show notes page as well, so then I've junkie.com slash five zero, I've junkie.com slash 50. So without further ado, let's get to it. Alex from Alex's Knife Box. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you've got questions or comments, call the 24-7 Knife Junkie listener line at 724-466-4487. I'm here with Alex T. of Alex's Knife Box. Uh, Alex's Knife Box is a uh, new and growing YouTube knife channel, and it's uh, it's really killing it, and Alex is killing it with his uh, ever-improving collection. Alex is also a host of Sharp Talk, a, another knife podcast, and I recently uh, came on the show and and spoke with him and his compadres, and I had an absolute blast. Alex, thanks for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks for having me, man. Really, really excited to be here. I had such a good time on Sharp Talk. I think you guys have a great uh, combination of temperaments, personalities, expertises, and passions. How did that all come together? When did you guys start doing that? Thank you very much for the compliment. I really appreciate that. Uh, we definitely are different characters, that's for sure, all of us. But truthfully, the way it came about is um, I, I started listening to podcasts on my own probably, I don't know, maybe like about a year ago. And uh, including yours, uh, the Knife Nuts podcast and a couple other of them. And I just thought to myself, man, this sounds like a great thing to do. Have some fun. I'm sure I'm not going to be as good as the rest, but, you know. So I hit up one of my buddies that I talked to on uh, Instagram and Facebook. And, uh, you know, I just flat out asked him, like, hey, what do you think about doing a podcast? And uh, he said, sure. Uh, and that's Tom from Hosting Outdoors. And then, so originally, um, we, we, we try to come up with a group of people, uh, Gerald, Gerald from Florida, who runs Outpost 76 on YouTube, does a lot of knife testing and he does a lot of, uh, like knife reviews and such. So both him and Tom do a lot of like steel testing. And that's kind of the part of the knowledge that I'm less familiar with in the sharpening. I'm more on the collector's aspect, more like the, mm -hmm you know, the designs and the locks and who makes what. And uh, then they said, well, hey, let's have a fourth person. And then so they said, have you ever heard of Super Steel Steve? I'm like, you know, I really haven't seen his channel, but let me check him out. So I checked him out. I'm like, whoa, that guy's a character. <laughs> so I can find yeah. him along. Let's do it. So then, uh, it's been, uh, we've been part of a podcast and everybody said, yes, let's roll. And we've been doing it ever since. Well, you guys seem like, uh, like brothers up there or maybe cousins, <laughs> you know, you're, you're ribbing each other, but you're also, uh, but obviously there's major love, but also you all seem to know when to step in on a topic. You, you guys have a great format. You have uh, a what's in your pocket, which we will get to. You sent me an Insta, uh, you sent me a, a text today <laughs> showing me what you were yeah. carrying. And uh, I just about fell out of my seat. But, uh, you know, you talk about what you're carrying and then you talk about new knives. And I loved that aspect. I love that aspect of your show. And I loved being included in that where uh, Tom floats up a uh, a new knife from whomever. We talked about Spider. We talked about the uh, the gold class Crooked River. That was some that was some good dialogue. there. Oh, man. yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's just really like the fun part. 
and we try to make it a little bit less uh, formatted at first. And and me being the way I am, I I'm like, well, we need structure, guys. We need to have segments, and we need to have a system down, and and, and it just kind of it. Some of those episodes are cluster <laughs> f's, uh, <laughs> but you know, we we get through it, and they're very long. And uh, but we just talk about what we enjoy, you know. So you were the one craving structure. Is that due to your Marine Corps background? Tell us, tell me about oh, that. Oh, uh, yeah. So I did uh, four years in the Marine Corps, field artillery. Before you continue, I want to say thank you for voluntarily taking that on and fighting for my freedom and my family's freedom. Uh, that is greatly appreciated. No one told you. No one made you go do that. You did that on your own. And uh, it's greatly appreciated on my end. Thank you, man. Thank you. Uh, it's It was a pleasure serving this damn fine country, I'll tell you that. So you were in artillery? Yes. Yes. Big cannons. Uh, I shot a 155 millimeter howitzer. <sighs> yeah, yeah, we blew stuff up. And um, I actually, that's really what kicked off my uh, need for a knife. When I was younger, I know some people had grandpa passing down a pocket knife. I came from a lineage of military, and my family goes back generations and generations, uh, originating more in Europe. But, um, you know, being in America, you know, I walked into the recruiter's office, and, um, you know, I looked for the coolest uniform, and the Marine Corps was the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but, yeah, so when you when you serve in the, mili- in the Marine Corps artillery units, you – basically have a five ton truck with full of Marines to operate this big cannon. And there's these big pallets with these extremely thick ropes that are tied around them. And you basically got to use knife as a pry bar, which everybody loves to hear, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and I broke countless knives uh, in the Marine Corps, which eventually made me want to buy more expensive ones. And at the time for me, an expensive knife was a $80 Kershaw. Ah, but yeah, in the early two thousands, yeah. you know, Kershaw was pretty respectable knife, and you know, you know, I I, st- I think I would still find it an eighty dollar Kershaw expensive, but <laughs> no, I'm just <laughs> kidding. But they are they are fantastic knives. So so you broke a lot of knives. What about the ones? Uh, what about what, what was issued to you? Oh, I got a K bar. Okay, uh, that's that that was issued to me. Uh, I had a very old hand-me-down bayonet that was given to me too and that's pretty much all they give you you know you kind of marine corps is uh the military group that does more with less you know they uh, we get the leftovers of all the uh uncle sam supplied uh stuff (laughs) yeah like they're still flying the uh the cobras right the huey cobras absolutely still making good use out of that airframe well and that's funny you know i didn't i heard that going on from boot camp to MCT and all my other training. And I didn't really realize it until I got to the point where I went to field artillery school. And, you know, so we're showing up, we're training with this huge cannon. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And, you know, I kind of look over. Now, I did my training in Fort Seal, Oklahoma, Mm -hmm. where uh, most artillery schools kind of are centered. And when I went there, you know, we show up in our truck, all the Marines get out, get ready to spread the cannon, dig the spades. And then I look over to the left and I'm like, what in the world is that? And I see the ar- army unit. It was two guys. One guy was in the driver's seat of a truck. And then they had this lifted up kind of rocket loaded, propelled, self-propelled system going on. And then there was a guy in the back shooting the rockets from the back of the truck. Two Whoa. guys rocket assisted propelled stuff and i'm like what in the world is that they're like oh that's their artillery i'm like oh so we need like 20 guys with an old school cannon and then they get their rocket assisted crap yeah you're you're taking those big long tampers and shoving it down the barrel to make sure that the powder's packed in and they've got rockets (laughs) oh yeah yeah it's yeah it's hilarious so do you remember any of the uh what did you break do you remember uh, what you may have broken on those big fat ropes holding that ammunition down you know, I, I wasn't into knives in the collecting aspect. I yeah. just went to the store. I'm like, that looks good. I'm going to keep that in my pocket. And I would pry it open and I would resharpen it with a rock I found on the <laughs> ground. Because we were out there for weeks at a time. So I didn't, you know, 
I didn't think too much of it. It was just a tool that I just beat the hell out of. So that scenario is real. That's something uh, whenever you hear um, Ernest Emerson talking about his chisel grind, uh, he's always like, well, it's easier to sharpen with a rock in the field. And I'm like, okay, I like chisel grinds. You don't have to justify it to me. But I mean, come on, who does that? You do that. Alex T does that. Oh, uh, yeah. It's it's not pretty either, man. Uh, wow. Yeah, you don't want to do that to a nice knife. Uh, but, you know, if you got nothing else and, you know, I mean, it with all the crap that we did, we, we would destroy stuff. And we didn't have a like a pry bar or anything to use. Mm-hmm. So I just li- literally like went, I'd have an extra knife in my pack, have one in my pocket. I have a big fixed blade, but I didn't really want to break those. Right. So I would use the little folders. Have you seen Les George's EOD knives? Yes. He was a, oh my gosh. They're like, they, they're t- you know, people, people use the term sharpened pry bar. Well, that's exactly what that is. I guess for digging around in rocks and sand, looking for IEDs and such, but that looks like, those look like knives. You could do absolutely anything you feel like to, and they won't even notice. Yep. I, I agree, man. And I love purpose uh, driven knives. Like I even think there's a couple striders out there that they made like folders, which have like an anti-magnetic type of uh, blade. Oh, wow. I can't remember what it's called, but it's got a gold color. Um, and that was strictly for EOD, you know? So you're prying around, you know, since it doesn't have any magnetic properties to it, then you can kind of defuse bombs or I don't know, whatever those guys do. So fast forward 19, 20 some odd years or something like that. And uh, what were you walking around with your pocket uh, in your pocket today? Uh, so today I had a uh, Michael Ziba uh, Mini S5, and uh, that's a collaboration with Jason Knight, which I highly respect. Awesome uh, knife maker. Who is a uh, rotating judge on Forged and Fire? Yes, yeah. I haven't seen him on there in a while. A and Kukri I'm specialist. Yeah, that's exactly what he is. So it's no surprise if you look at the S5, it's kind of almost a resemblance of a folding kukri. And the blade was made out of uh, Redfield's Damascus, which is a dragon skin Damascus. Yeah, just describe that for people. It's 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 unbelievable. So uh, Redfield Damascus is, I don't think anybody knows the recipe except for this one guy. And uh, it's it basically looks like a scaly pattern And most people will treat it with hot salts, like kind of a process that they do. And it'll give it this blue purple hue to it, um, which looks really fantastic. Uh, Mike made that for me. I think he made a total of eight of those. Mm. And he says he's probably never using that stuff again because it was a pain in the uh, rear to to (laughs) color and treat. So... So he, he told me flat out, he's like, try not to scratch this one, Alex. I'm like, uh, I'll do what I can. <laughs> so my, my, okay, so you, you, you texted me that picture today. And so yeah. that, that it's that beautiful purple blue dragon skin Damascus blade. And it's a recurve blade and it has a nice big kind of almost triangular fuller in it. Yep. And then it's set against this gorgeous, um, it looks like a once bronzed uh, handle maybe. And, and, but, but it, it has this sort of feeling of wear to it. And then you flipped it on the, on the uh, spine and that damn cool backspacer. It's like four or five skulls stacked on one another. And I am not a skull guy. I've never been into that motif. Well, I have been into that motif, but I haven't been into that motif since, you know, I was into punk rock back in high school kind of thing. And, uh, skulls, I don't know, but the skulls on that are absolutely breathtaking it's like a little mini sculpture jammed in there well michael zeba uh i think don't quote me on it but i think has a jeweler's background if i remember right which would make a lot of sense uh but he 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 has this whole line of uh his knives recently have a lot of skulls he's made them from sterling silver uh this one's bronze uh, uh, like or brass he's made them in brass he's made them in all kinds of materials he even uses gold, actually, oh, in some wow. of his eyes. Yeah, and they're they're in full three dimensional relief. It's it it looks like a bunch of yeah. little skulls wedged in there. It's not like it's a a trump ploy or a picture carved into into the backspacer. And I remember he used to. I don't know if he still does this. Um, he had uh, his pocket clips were like wings. I remember. Yes. Yes. Beautiful. 
Yeah, he does the Devil's Tale. He does Wings. Um, he's done, as a matter of fact, there's a model called the Angry Bird because one of the clips is made to a face of a bird. I actually oh, have yeah. one of those. Oh, man. I love that thing. Well, tell me about the evolution of your collecting. And, and uh, you know, I was shocked. It, you gave me a tip for someone uh, I should talk to on the show. And then you yep. said, yeah, you should see what he's making for me. Wink, wink. And I was like, <laughs> oh, man, this guy, you've, you've, got, you've got a knife maker in every port making you something cool. How did you start collecting? And, and when did it evolve to this heightened state? Well, uh, so I started actually collecting knives other than just having a regular pocket knife. Uh, probably back in around 2013-ish, maybe late 2012. And um, I just decided, I'm like, for some odd reason, I, I thought to myself, look, I really want to have a nice pocket knife that's going to last me a lifetime. So I started doing a bunch of research on the internet. Usually when I do any hobby, before I jump into anything, I'm just like reading for hours mm -hmm. obsessively about everything. So back at that time, M390 was kind of a, a big deal. It was not as common as it is today. It, today, you'll find it everywhere. But um, so I decided I wanted M390. And then, you know, I'm like, wow, they make these knives out of titanium and there's ball bearings. What in the world? Uh, and being a former military guy and having some friends, you know, like Benchmade made kind of a lot of sense to me. So I found this Benchmade that I liked. I didn't really like I didn't, wasn't looking for anything too tactical or anything like that, but I wanted something really kind of classy yet slim, comfortable to carry. You know, it's just something useful, but with a decent sized blade. So I ended up with a uh, monolock. I think it's a 361 monolock. Or I can't remember the model number, but it's a Benchmade monolock. It looks like a flat two. It look, kind of looks like a Sabenza in some respects, I guess. Two flat slabs of titanium. M390 ball bearing uh, knife. And then, you know, of course, when you get one, then you start looking around. What else is there? I'm you totally know? unfamiliar with that concept. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, you know, it just kind of went crazy from there. And I did that thing that, you know, knife collectors do where they're like, well, this is a really nice knife, but what about in the purpose of getting like something cheap and that I can beat up? Let me buy this Spyderco Endura and then, okay, oh, you know, this PM2 looks good. I need one of those too. And it just went crazy from there. So uh, in essence, you're, you're kind of working both angles, both ends of it. You love the super fine handmade custom knives. And when I say custom, custom, you know, they're taking your order and doing what you want. But you're also not against slumming it. You, well, you got this uh, Pilar project. What is that? Oh, yeah. So that is, you know, I know some people like to wait till the video is revealed, but I'll just let you know, it's not a big secret. So I decided that, you know, it. Uh, I, I do like inexpensive knives. The price doesn't really matter to me. It's the design and function and, mm -hmm. and elegance of it. And, you know, it's no big secret that that Pilar's are pretty popular right now and have been since they came out. So I thought I would buy the, the Pilar that you know, I wouldn't have to modify. So I got one of those uh, Blade HQ exclusives with the S35VN mm -hmm. and the carbon fiber. However, I really prefer Micarta. So, <laughs> you know, I bought a Micarta scale for it. I bought a like green backspacer. I bought all kinds of little parts. Right. And, um, and then the blade, I didn't disclose this on my YouTube video, but the blade is actually getting reground. Oh my God. Yeah. It's the $400 CRKT Pilar. <laughs> I love it. it. And I got to blast this guy because he's, he's been part of our, he's being uh, like a kind of like a background podcast member. Uh, it's a knife maker. He's fairly new. Uh, surprisingly, he only lives like 30 minutes away from me. So I'm going to go check out his shop, but oh, uh, cool. it's called Transparent Knives. And the reason why he calls it transparent knives is because all the pricing, everything, like what he buys stuff for, he's all transparent about it mm -hmm. and just builds you whatever. So he did this crazy finish uh, lately on a couple knives that he calls shattered mirror. It almost looks like a stone wash mirror polish, but it's got kind of like a little like crack going all the way through. Mm. It looks really cool. Yeah, so that's cool. 
So he orders some new belts. He's like, I'm excited. I'm going to use this new finish on your Pilar. I'm like, dude, just do what you do. Like, I give you free reign of making it look however you want to look. Just grind it thinner and make it look cool. So, <laughs> well, how, how does that work? I, I'm, I'm, uh, I got one custom knife from uh, one of the guests on the show, uh, Douglas Esposito. Of mm-hmm. attention to detail, it's a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful double-edged uh, kind of gentleman's fighter. I, I, I know you've seen it um, in pictures uh, with the uh, tortoiseshell handle. So that was done exactly that to my spec. And now I'm having uh, my second custom knife, which I will reveal when it when it arrives, is being made. My question to you, as someone who I, I am finding out. You have a lot of projects, a lot of irons in the fire, pun intended. Uh, <laughs> what is your? Uh, do you sometimes let uh, a knife maker just do? You, do you tell them, give them free reign to do whatever they want because you love their vision? And other people, you say, I want this, 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 and this. How does that work? I'm going to need to know soon. <laughs> oh yeah, man. So I do things a couple different ways. There's times where I buy a knife and I'm like, man, I really love this knife, but I could. I could do without this and I would have changed a little something about that. And, you know, most of the time I'm not shy. I just hit up, you know, whoever I'm interested in at the time. And I ask them flat out, I'm like, Hey, can we build a project together? You know, and like, um, I'm building a project with Fernando Medina from, uh, Medina custom knives or line works, whatever he calls his company. And, um, uh, I flat out told him, so I, he has this model called the Hellcat and I've been on his waiting list for a while. I gave him a couple hundred bucks to put, hold a spot for me about a year ago. And then I hit him up and I said, Hey, is it time? He's like, yeah, you know, let's, let's, let's get it going. So, you know, when he, when him and I were talking, he's, he's telling me, well, you know, so right now I have D2 in stock for steels. How about, you know, or do you want me to order you some M390? And I asked him, like, what you got in Damascus? And he's like, well, I don't have anything. I'm like, don't you worry about it. So I called Vegas Forge and I ordered some razors, Damascus, and I had, I paid for it and I shipped it over to him. It should be there on Friday. Wow. And then I went and did a little research. I found some legit Westinghouse micarta. Wow. And then I paid for that and had that shipped over. And hooked up Fernando with the guy so that if he wants some for future projects, he can get some. And then I told him exactly what I wanted. He said, okay. I'm like, just make it sweet, you know? And uh, so that'll be a very nice knife with uh, some zirconium bolsters. Oh, my God. We're going to do micarta uh, pivot colors, micarta uh, scales, and micarta backspacer all in Westinghouse. And then it should be, yeah. Like a tuxedo. So that's a uh, that's a Warncliffe style blade, right? Yeah. Rich? Okay. Um, so tell people what Westinghouse. You and I are, are my Carta guys, and Westinghouse is kind of the uh, holy grail. Uh, that's an overused term. It's what is it? It's the elusive uh, fountain of youth, or whatever for uh, for my Carta. Tell, tell people what Westinghouse is. Well, I mean, you can definitely Google it and find tons of information on it. But basically, it was it was used as an insulation uh, for electronics and other different kind of components. I think it started in the early 1900s. And um, it's just usually found in old warehouses of like stock that never got used or um, and people have been going crazy for it for mm-hmm. making custom knives. I mean, and, and it's nice because when when you shave down the layers of it, you get different color texture to it. So it almost looks like a caramel flaw, you know, like it's yes. got this, it's got kind of like a burnt center and then on the outside gets creamy colored. So it looks really nice. But there's also like dark brown my, uh, Westinghouse micara. There's maroon Westinghouse. There's all kinds of colors. One thing I do want to mention, I know a lot of people have fear of asbestos because there was Westinghouse with asbestos in it. Oh, wow, <laughs> that's, that's disagreeable. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that stuff is very, very rare now, if any exists at all. And it's it was all based out of Europe. So it's very unlikely to find that stuff in, in America. So you can rest assured you're 
you'll be okay from mesothelioma. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what about uh, knives made in this country? Is is that all you do? I, I've posted a, a number of uh, of riots and and wees and such, and uh, you have complimented their their beauty, but I've, but I've also uh, inferred, you know, you you stick to American made when it comes to knives anyway. What, what's your, uh, what's your philosophy on that? So it's, it's one of those things like, uh, oh man, you pinned me on this one. <laughs> I, get, <laughs> I get, I get called out on this all the time. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it, man. All right. So, so, so here's how I feel. So I have no problems with, with Chinese made knives. I actually own quite a few Kershaw's that are inexpensive Chinese made knives and the the problem the the or the the way the reason why I didn't like a lot of them was because I felt like a lot of them were missing soul. They all look like they're factory cut and you know just kind of like you see a rush of a million different designs and although they function quite well and maybe they're aesthetically pleasing to some people, mm -hmm. um, they they didn't have any soul to me, any character in a lot of respects and now. There is one Chinese manufacturer that I feel differently about, and that's going to be Riot, because I've found that I've held a few. And like today, uh, one of my coworkers brought a Chavez 228 Riot, the Rendition or whatever yeah. it is. And I was blown away. I mean, that thing dropped shut like my Grimsmo Norseman. It was, it was bouncing off the stop pin. Wow. And the, the quality fit and finish was just unbelievable. And I can't argue that. Now, will I go and buy one of those? No, I'll probably go buy the real Chavez because that's just what I do. <laughs> I'm not all American. As a matter of fact, a lot of my buddies are making fun of me because I'm doing a lot of Russian knives. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> you know, with the whole Russian you know thing going on. The, eh, the there's always a Russian thing going on. But you know what? Yeah. Their knife makers are probably cool as hell, just like they are all over the place. They're amazing. And they're very reasonably priced. Um, and they're a big fan of S125, which is a steel I was really interested in. Mm. Um, and I have actually quite a few projects going on on that side of the world. And I've been collecting a lot of knives from South Africa as well. Oh yeah. They're, they're blowing up or I don't know if they're blowing up, but they, uh, they have a, a, a nice stable of like extremely talented knife makers. Amazing. Do you have a Shamwari? No. That's a Gareth Bull, right? Yeah. I've, I've been hunting that, but that's kind of like something I, I, I spoke to people about in a couple podcasts ago is just like the Holt Spectre, the Shamwari, there's these knives that are so hot on the market right now that people are charging double. Yeah. I refuse. I'm yeah. sorry. I won't. <laughs> I'll wait till they come down, you know, but I yeah. do want one. I mean, you saw how it happened with hinderers back in the day. They were going for 800 bucks now, you know, with, uh, with production the way it is and everything settled into a nice, uh, nice pricing structure and, and you could have just waited a couple of years, but sometimes you just can't wait yep. and, uh, and you end up laying down stupid money on something. Absolutely, man. So who would you say of the U.S. knife makers? Maybe you don't want to go there, but who are your favorites? My favorites? Yeah. Uh, I'm still I was gonna, I was going to ask you for one absolute favorite, but then why, why put you in that corner? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's really hard because if you if you see my collection, I really have a wide spectrum of stuff and I it's I'm really attached to all those knives for different reasons. I mean, uh, I mean, I've been enjoying I've been enjoying interacting with some of the uh custom knife makers. Fernando's been a pleasure to deal with. He's a lot of fun. Um uh, Michael Ziva is a uh a uh, knife maker out of Brooklyn that I've been talking to for years. He's, he's wonderful. There's, a, there's so many, man. I, I really couldn't pick a favorite. They're all good in their own way, you know? Right, right. And if you, I, I have a feeling your collection is pretty vast. I think you, like me, or like a lot of us, uh, 
fellow travelers, if you will, like variety. That's why we collect. We like different shaped blades, different style actions, different kinds of locks. I mean, I, I have to um, stop myself from holding on to things that I never, ever, ever carry just because it has an interesting mechanism. And, and I have to remember, I'm not the curator of a museum. I am not, uh, you know, I'm not responsible for, um, for continuing the knife legacy into the next generation. Uh, all I'm really responsible for is is not uh, is not you know putting my family on the street with this with the hobby habit. I almost said habit. <laughs> uh, agreed, agreed. <laughs> so, how how many knives in your collection would you say if you had to number them? Oh crap! Oh, my wife's not listening. <laughs> She's tuned out by now. Yeah. Uh, you know, honestly, I, I, I don't, I don't even know at this point, including fixed blades are probably somewhere in the neighborhood. I've been downsizing a lot, um, but probably still about like 120, 130. That's, that's respectable. That's not, that's not yeah. extreme. That's it used to be worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said recently in a conversation we had that you recently unloaded 40 knives at once. Uh, well, it, within a few months. Yeah. That's that's Marine Corps discipline, you know. I, <laughs> I'm 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 astounded how how you yeah. can go through and find forty like in a short period of time. Well, it's um, you know, it's it's kind of like what you and Epic Snuggle Bunny were talking about in an earlier episode, and you've been mentioning. It's about reducing and refining, and yeah. it it got to the point where I'm like, I started doing the math. I'm like, man, by the time if I rotate my knives every day, a new one. I won't even see this knife for another like four or five months. Like this is ridiculous. You know, like I, why do I need so many? So, um, and I, there's a, another guy on Instagram that really inspired me to reduce and refine. And, uh, his collection is absolutely amazing. He goes under that's underscore, not underscore and a, a, a underscore a knife. It's like, mm -hmm. that's not a knife. Right. right. Underscores in between. Right. Uh, my buddy Russell and uh, I hang out with him sometimes and he lets me hold his black snow custom opiates oh. where he's got uh, I think two custom uh, I think he's got like four black snow knives two opiates and uh, what's that other this not the sabotage the, the one that they made into a um spider, a spider yeah. yeah he's a he's Polish too right no black he's snow? from Israel Oh, he's from Israel. Okay. Yeah. He must be a jeweler also. I mean, the, the look of his stuff is... He's definitely a jeweler. That I know for a fact. And Nadi is is known as being one of the nicest guys in the industry. Uh, but the, the poor guys, you know, he can... At the rate that he makes his knives, I mean, he could probably pump out maybe two or three a month mm. because the complexity of it. So he's mm -hmm. got like a backlog of like five years. Uh, it's, it's incredible what he does though. I've, I've held those knives. I've gotten the pleasure to play with, uh, quite a few of, uh, those and it's, it's, it's incredible. It's out of my reach though. Yeah. I mean, those are, I mean, yeah, I, I almost wouldn't want one because you, you, you would feel guilty about not carrying it because, well, I would anyway. Yep. But uh, when we got off on, on black snow, you were, you were talking about your friend who, uh, uh that's not a knife with underscores in between who's who has reduced and refined you, you you think he has kind of crested that process in a way and and you think he's hit a stride and now he can keep it to a manageable refined level is that what you're saying well yeah so i asked him straight up because the way him and i met is i bought a knife off of him from instagram and i used to follow him for a couple of years before that come to find out he lives about you know half hour away from me too so we met up and then he's like, Hey man, uh, I'm just going to bring a whole bunch of stuff that you can handle. You know, when we meet up, when you buy this knife, I'm like, well, you know, just bring one or whatever. And he brings like, a, like, I think he brought like 10 knives. I mean, we're talking like, I think like four or five of them were, uh, Ian's knife from CMF. Oh yeah. God. Uh, beautiful. I mean, you're talking like, dude, I don't even know. I don't even want to know how much money those 10 <laughs> knives were. And I'm like, Jesus, man, like, <laughs> what, 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 how did you get all these? He's like, well, I started just like you, you know, but then I had all these knives. And now I think he's down to about like 20 or 25 knives, but he carries these things every day. 
And the cool thing about having, you know, a knife from a custom knife maker, and he has relationships with these guys, like he knows Ian personally. Mm-hmm. The the cool thing is you beat up the knife, you send it to him, he, he'll he fix it. You know, it's brand new again. So he's not worried about using it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, makers take special pride in their work. And if there's something jacked up about it, probably more likely than not, they're going to want to fix it. They're going to probably fall all over themselves to fix it and make you happy. You know, because they, it's not like they have a huge uh, product line or, or a huge uh, backlog that they can fall back on if people start dropping away. Right. So really what I'm, what I'm getting uh, is the main thing is soul, knives that have soul. Yes. And, and I love that. Um, uh, do you know Apostle P on YouTube? I do. He did a video a few years ago that changed my collecting life. He, it, it was all about knives with soul. And, uh, and that's when I was like, why don't I get rid of these five ZT hinderers and buy one hinderer? And and that's how that started mm-hmm. for me. Um, it was the knives with soul thing. And I'm like, I, I just, I've always loved hinderers at design and function. And uh, he's from Ohio. I'm from Ohio. I was like, yeah, support my fellow Ohio boy and all this. And uh, started getting a few knives with soul. And, and I would like to continue that, you know, with more customs, but I also like kind of tweaking and customizing the good knives I have, like the ZTs, that they're all finding my car to handles now and, and different clips and and just kind of making them mine. But that getting down to 20 just sounds so good. Yeah. It sounds so yep. good, but it but it sounds uh, like a, a pipe dream at the beginning of a diet. You know, I'm going to yep. be shredded, you know, in a month and it's going to be incredible. You know, you get the enthusiasm the first day. He has the help of his wife, uh, you know. Uh, encouraging that, trust me. <laughs> Lucky guy, man. Like, she knows, man. She knows, and he's like, man. My wife's telling me I got, I got to sell some. So then, you know, and I go visit him a couple months later, and he's like, oh, dude, look at these three or four that I got. I'm like, Jesus, man, that's another <laughs> fifteen grand. He's like, yeah, but it's in my PayPal, so you know. <laughs> yeah, oh, God. yeah, PayPal, man. That's that's funny money, man. Yeah. I have a uh, I have a friend at work who's obsessed with fly fishing, and he's always like, "We enable one another." He's like, "There's another fly rod up, and I got some PayPal money." Bob, you got a knife coming up, you know? Yeah, we justify yeah. each other's purchases. So, what what are your favorite materials? I mean, because materials really lend themselves to the idea of soul. You were talking about Westinghouse micarta, this beautiful yeah. old, um, you know, it it actually seems to show its age without looking old. You know what I mean? Exactly. Um, what other materials do you gravitate towards? You know, I, I've I've tried uh, all kinds of various things. Everything that I've seen in a picture that looked really cool, and it's hard to tell in pictures because everybody uses filters. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I want to say some of my favorite stuff. I have a custom knife that I had built with um, Casey from uh, man, it's escaping me right now. But I had a custom knife built with him called a Chupacabra, mm-hmm. and. And his knife, it's Old Dominion Knife Works is his company. Oh, he must be from around here where, where I am in Virginia. He is. He is. He's actually in Virginia. And uh, he is buying a knife with some superconductor bolsters. Oh. And I love that superconductor material. It looks awesome, but it's really high maintenance. Everybody loves Timascus. I, I'm really kind of interested. I, d- I don't have a knife. I mean, I have one knife with a pocket clip out of Zerkatai, mm-hmm. but I really like that gray with the color contrast in between. That's pretty uh, cool. But um, this will be my first Westinghouse micarta knife, and I'm really interested. I'm a, I'm a micarta. Uh, for my uh, level of collecting, micarta is absolutely my favorite handle material. But I swear, I, I positively lusting after some knives like a, a Terzwilla ATCF with, with, uh, I love, uh, antique ivory, um, oh, yeah. mammoth ivory and yep. stag and, and the, and those kind of materials that are from animals, that, but have variations in color. You know, I love, I love jig bone and stuff like that on slip joints and such too, but, right. but that, that stag and, and especially uh, that mammoth ivory is just, oh, so killer, especially when you combine it with the modern materials of titanium and like really slicked out steel with a, you know, with a nice grind. I, I love that contrast, the new and the old. I agree with you 100%. And Mammoth Ivory is definitely on my list. 
it's 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 those natural materials that really give the knife a lot of soul which is what we were talking about before you know yeah so uh, what about fixed blades i mean you mentioned that you have some you're more of a folder collector i'm i'm assuming but uh what kind of fixed blades do you gravitate towards well truth be told if i had to leave the house that there is no way i would grab any folder that i have i'm actually more all about the fixed blades I carry folders and collect folders because it's it probably scares my wife less. <laughs> uh, you know, it's easier to store. Um, and I like the whole mechanics, locks, and materials aspect of it. But truth, truth be told, I if I had to pick one or the other, a fixed blade all day long. And I have, um, a, a, I have a custom uh, 1909 Bowie that was built for me from Bark River. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's a big one, too. Is that the one that looks kind of like the um, uh, the one that uh, uh, Brad Pitt carries in Inglorious Bastards? It's got that big, fat Bowie blade with a kind of relatively short but upswept clip. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, they make it in a couple different profiles. They make it in a clip point, and um, I, then they have one that's a little bit more Bowie-like, uh, Bowie-like, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm a, I, I can never say it now i'm just yeah. like Boo-o-wee. I, I just yes don't say clip point <laughs> yeah exactly so um but yeah i have one of those i have a uh, bravo survivor that i really like another buoy design and then i have a bravo four I these are all is. these are all bark rivers all bark rivers mm-hmm. Um, I have a couple other, um, I have a Benchmade Ar- Arbinus mm-hmm. in S30B. What else? God, I, I have a, uh, a knife from uh, Fox that was developed for the Chilean military. And uh, it's a USMC edition with desert camo on it. Cool. I have some really crazy stuff. Is that a parang shaped one? It's kind of a blunt, not blunt, but a very rounded front. It looks kind of like a indigenous machete, but in knife form. Uh, it's it's definitely smaller than a machete. It's mm-hmm. it's it's going to be like I think like a five inch blade, maybe a roundish. Uh, I'll send you a picture later whenever I dig that thing out. Cool. <laughs> you should check out some tops knives if you if you like the fixed blades. They are they have so many different models and they're 1095 made in idaho yeah idaho i'm not sure now i'm I'm blocking i think it's idaho so uh yeah right up your alley american made (laughs) well i i I have a tops tom brown tracker oh that's right that's right you mentioned the yeah 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 you mentioned that to me before yeah and i have a desert harpoon from tops uh i have a few few tops myself I got you. There, there's some, there's a lot under the surface. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm sure there's stuff I'm forgetting, but I love fixed blades flat out. Me too. Me too, man. Have you ever tried your hand at making one? No, nah, I've never tried making a knife. Um, I, I've been tempted, but it's, it's something that uh, I, I want to go take a class. I think before I try to get into it. Yeah, I've been recommended that a lot by a lot of makers. You know, take a class first, see what it's all about. The way my hobbies work, you know, I, I've always been into art, and uh, but but I'm always rotating through what I'm what I'm working on, and that is something that you can't just rotate in and out of and be excellent at. You know, I think you need to be, um, you need to be getting yourself in the zone on a daily basis to really learn how to grind well. Because there, I've had times, you know, I've I've made about twenty knives. I haven't worked on a knife in about a year, and. Uh, I, I just have a an old craftsman belt grinder, but I have experienced the flow state doing that, but only ever grinding one side of the knife. And then I flip it onto the other side and the, like, so I'll have one grind on one side. That's absolutely beautiful. And then the other side is totally wonky and there's nothing I can do to fix it. And the more I try and fix it, the more wonky it gets. I'm like, yeah. geez, maybe this is why people do chisel ground blades. <laughs> you know, you just yeah. get one really awesome side, get, get really good at grinding on one side. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, well, so, uh, do you have a knife story? Do you have some sort of funny knife story from all of these, uh, years could be from the Marines could be from your most recent, uh, collecting experience, but I love collecting knife stories from, from knife people. Oh man. 
I'm trying to think of a of a story. Um, I mean, I could I could mention a story about uh, my boss. You know, the the so I I, I started working with this guy uh, maybe about a year ago, and he used to carry some spider codes and. I think he had like the Spidey Chef was like the, the nicest thing he had. And um, he um, all of a sudden, you know, when I start bringing some custom knives to work, he's like, let me handle that real quick. So he started playing with some of these higher end knives. And then he decided that he was going to buy his first nice knives. And I didn't want to help him through the journey at all. You know, mm-hmm. I'm like, I want to see, you know, you, you got to look and see what you like. You know, don't don't worry about what I have. Just try to figure out what you like. Do some research. So he bought himself a Microtech SOCOM, but Ooh. a custom one. Oh, man. He went right in. He went right in. And then he also started out buying a couple Shira Grow Offs. So I'm, he... He he has he has the budget for it, and he just went nuts. Um, oh so by the end of the first month, he had like three shiros. He had like, I think like three custom microtechs, and now he is on like a lot of the Instagram and the groups. He's the custom SoCom guy. He has like twenty two oh of them. God. And Abalone, Moki May, he has like every single SoCom you can think of. So that cracks me up, you know, it's just, yeah. it's, it's so cool. And then, uh, he just sent a production one to, uh, Bama Knife Guy on, uh, YouTube, uh, which Bama Knife Guy is doing a whole segment on just torturing this poor SOCOM oh. just to show you guys how durable it is. It's, it's pretty cool. You guys should check it out. That sounds awesome. It's funny to me how, um, and, and, and understandable how people get, can either be like you or me and have like, really varied taste and want to touch all bases and then other people just lock onto a design or a brand or a maker and it's just they want everything from it and and i can i can actually understand both instincts i just can't afford both instincts but just to have it i would love to have every single emerson made i'd love to have every single you know there there are a couple of brands i feel that way about and uh like tops i'd love to have every single tops knife Mm -hmm. and then and then the ones i i don't like which i can't imagine i'd give to friends or whatever Okay, I'm going to ask you to get philosophical before we go to our speed round here. Sure. What is it about knives, Alex? What is it about knives that has people like you and me, A, talking for hours about them, spending money on them, thinking about them when we're not around them, and planning our collection? What what is it about that particular tool? Well, that's interesting because I'm still trying to figure out the answer to that. Um, It's quite weird, but I will tell you this, that... Um, when I started getting into knives, you know, and I started getting into a couple Facebook groups, Instagram, stuff like that. And you start talking to the other knife guys, they really think and start going through, you start to realize these people are a lot like you, you know, like even the funny stuff they do, like, you know, hide from their wives, make sure they ship it to work. <laughs> You know, you start really getting a kick out of like, hey, how you do it, man? You know, or, <laughs> or like, I, you know, like you got one guy post. I remember I posted a video of me like behind my gate, like a sniper, you know, waiting for the, <laughs> the, the postman to drop off my box. And, you know, we just get a lot of laughs. And then you start wanting to share information. Hey, where did you get that? And the knife community is a pretty incredible place. Yeah. I've seen people give away stuff, you know, out of good causes. And I've seen, you know, like uh, I saw like a GoFundMe page just to a fellow knife group guy. He he got hurt at work. And, you know, the knife group people started GoFundMe that ended up raising like $15,000 for him and his family to kind of stay afloat. So it's a really incredibly like small, big place where, you know, all of us kind of like, get away from our real world life and just enjoy our own company. And the cool thing is with the social media, um, you know, like you and I can be across the country right now yep. just talking about knives and enjoying it. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. You know, what you can always do is um, if you're busted walking in with a box, you say, Oh, well baby, this is a gift for you, but I didn't want you to know. And then, <laughs> and then of course you have to go buy something and present it later. But, 
you know, that's you just, great. Just be slick about it. <laughs> that's that's great, man. You know, and, and my you know my wife, I love her. You know, she's you know I, she married the almost the wrong guy in some aspects because I like fast cars, I <laughs> like knives, I shoot guns. Yeah, you're a guy. And you know, she doesn't like guns. She doesn't like knives. She doesn't like speed. You know, or like we love each other and we would never change anything about it. But I keep thinking like I'm like, man, this is so weird. Like there's nothing. So for a while, she's like, what are you getting all these knives for? I'm like, I'm collecting them. You know, and she's telling me, well, okay. And then, you know, five turned into 10, turned into 20, turned into 30. And then I ended up being, buying a big box that looks like a big, uh, it's wrapped in leather and it's got a, it looks like a bench. Hmm. And then you lift it up. It's got a lock. And then underneath, you know, is where I store all my knives. Oh, Hence, cool. Alex's knife box kind of idea came around. Yeah. It was just a box of knives. And um, it was the best thing I could do, guys, because you know what? The box is huge. And you can never tell how much more it's getting filled <laughs> up. <laughs> I hear you. You know, uh, you, you mentioned the, the differences, though. It, it is a beautiful balance. You know, um, I similar you know uh, just just having um having someone to temper you and then you being someone that can introduce that other side of of life that's kind of how it needs to be uh, I, right. uh, often to have a successful uh relationship but that's not what the show is about but i like that balance i like that she's not into that stuff you know but you know she used to say oh is that another knife because i would bring home a box right, right. And then it would, and then now it's over the last few years, she, she doesn't even ask anymore. Yeah. Like, she's like, Oh, that's cool. And now I'll show her, I'm like, look how much this one costs. This one was like 500. And she's like, Oh, it looks expensive. I'm like, yeah, it was 1200. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I really hope she's not listening. <laughs> nah. All right. So speed round. Are you ready? All right. Let's go. You're familiar with these questions, but a, a few of them have changed oh. for uh, for present company. All right. All right. Fixed or folder? Fixed. Flipper or thumb stud? Uh, thumb stud. Washers or bearings? Washers. Tip up or tip down? Uh, tip up. Tanto or buoy? Buoy. Buoy or Bowie? Bowie. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you slide on that one. Hollow ground or flat ground? Uh, God, these questions are hard when you're put on the spot. All right, I'll go with hollow ground. Okay, so full size or small? Full size. Gentleman's knife or tactical knife? Tactical. Automatic or bally song? Bally song. Grimsmo or Zeba? Grimsmo. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> okay, we or Riyadh, and you have to choose one. Riyadh. Benchmade or Spiderco? Spiderco. Milled titanium or spring clip? Milled. Carbon fiber or micarta? Micarta. Finger choil or no finger choil? No finger choil. Form or function? Oh, crap. <laughs> That's hard. Uh, damn it. Damn it. You know what? Form. Damn it. Thank you. Thank you. Someone who finally admits it. <laughs> Desert Island Knife. Now, this is one uh, for the rest of your life, not necessarily when you take to an actual desert island. I'm going to pick the Bark River A2 Steel Bravo Survivor. Nice. That's the that's the Bravo with the fatter blade, right? The right. Knife, the, okay. And a finger choil. And yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, a man's knife. Nice. Very nice choice, if I do say so myself. So, Alex, how do people uh, find your work? How do they how do they find Sharp Talk? How do they find Alex's knife box? And how can they get in touch with you? Yeah. Uh, so I'm on Instagram under Alex underscore knife box. And you can follow me, chat with me there. I'm always happy to chat with everyone. There's a lot of my knives. Not all of them are on there, but um, on my YouTube channel, you can find me on Alex's knife box with the apostrophe S and sharp talk is, uh, you can find us on, uh, Podbean, iTunes, Spotify, most of the regular ones that you'll find Bob on. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, we also do our episodes live on video. So if you guys join us on Twitch on under Shark Talk, you guys can actually see the video of us, shoot us questions live, and you know we can all have a good time. Yeah, I forgot to mention that aspect, the live questions. What a what a great what a great idea! And then having it all live on video, I had such a blast. Thanks again for having me on that show, man. That was great. Oh man, we're gonna have you back. That's for sure. So everybody, do yourself a favor. Check out Alex's Knife Box on YouTube. I mean, we didn't really go, even go into your videos. There's a lot more we can talk about, maybe for a future episode. But uh, his his you can just kind of track his collection on YouTube, and it just keeps getting better and better. I'm like, my God, what is he going to get next? Do yourself a favor. Check him out. The videos are are comprehensive, and 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 uh, he always gives an awesome shout out to people. He gave one to me once, which I really really appreciate. And yeah, it's just insightful and fun and you feel like you're hanging out with him. So, uh, Alex, thanks again for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast and we'll talk to you soon. Sounds great. Thank you so much. And thank you, Jim. You're welcome. You know you're a knife junkie if you plan your vacation around SHOT Show. And Bob, like you said uh, on the intro, uh, just a couple of knife buddies hanging out, chatting, you and Alex. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll be at work and I'll get a text. I'll be, you know, mired in whatever whatever boredom I'm in at work. Whatever fun stuff you're doing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Whatever <laughs> challenging and interesting thing I'm doing that day. And I'll get a text and I'll look down and it's no words. It's just a video from Alex of him flipping some amazing knife. This last time it was the it was the Zeba knife we talked about uh, during this podcast. And it's always a pick me up. I'm like, oh yeah, that's cool. That yeah. is a cool knife. You know, thanks, thanks, man. Yeah. So that's what a knife buddy is. So right. we're. Uh, and I think we're going to look at uh, maybe making a trade. You know, we, we both have some lower end knives and I'm looking to move, move them out of here, but I'd love to trade, you know, just mm -hmm. see what he has and he can have some of mine. And okay. it's a beautiful thing. Well, and uh, you notice uh, I did want to kind of mention one thing uh, right there at the end of the interview, Alex said, uh, thank you, Jim. And, <laughs> and I responded, <laughs> I just want you know, in case our listeners don't know, I'm always on the interviews that you do. I just kind of the silent partner in the background. So uh, yeah, I yeah. thought that was kind of cool that he he said hi. So, you know, <laughs> hi, Alex. <laughs> you got much love coming your way, sir. Well, I appreciate it on my on my journey to knife junkiehood from uh, knife <laughs> newbiehood, if you will. Hey, we teased it at the beginning. Yep. Uh, some some news uh, about the Knife Junkie podcast. I was going to say some exciting news. I hope I hope it's exciting news for our listeners. Want to spill the beans? Well, yeah, it certainly is. Well, we're going to come out with another podcast uh, during the week. Uh, bring it up on Thursday, right, Jim? Uh, Wednesday night, Thursday morning. Yeah, Wednesday night, Thursday morning. Feed. Yeah. So basically what we're doing is all of the um, segments that we've done before and after the interviews and, and different, uh, you know, whether it's knife news or talking about knives I've received uh, over the, the week. Tip of the week, moment, maintenance moment, those kind of things. All that stuff. We're putting that stuff in a show uh, separately. It'll only be 20 to 30 minutes long just so that we can get that stuff out as well as the interview, because we don't want to um, truncate the interview just to kind of yeah, stay absolutely. on time. Absolutely. And uh, some of these interviews go up, go long, not long, but I mean, I don't want to stop the momentum of the conversation right. to get in my little knife news bit. So we're just going to have a little supplemental show uh, during the week to, to talk about current things in the knife world and uh, maybe knives I've received that week or, you know, whatever's on our minds knife wise. Right. Well, and uh, right now we don't have a, a new name for it. It's just going to be the Knife Junkie Podcast. And you as a subscriber don't have to do anything different. It'll just show up in your feed, as we said, Wednesday night, Thursday morning, depending on your uh, podcast app, a podcast player of choice. But you can always find it online at the knifejunkie.com. You'll find it there uh, most likely on Wednesday nights. So uh, I'm looking forward to it, excited about it, and uh, hopefully too. not only share your journey, but uh, but my journey. I'll uh, just tease it by saying I'm bidding on about four or five knives on an online oh, auction yes. right now. So yes, yes. We'll see. I'm maybe interested to hear to about, about that one. <clears throat> yes, maybe we'll have something to talk about. So yeah. anyway. Sweet. All right. Going to wrap it up for episode number five zero, episode 50 of the Knife Junkie podcast. I want to thank you for listening. For Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim Person. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. 
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.